All right. Yes? Okay, so um, this is the fourth class, and here's what I want to do today. I really want to talk about log normality and about the binomial model. But before I can talk about those things, I need to talk to you a little bit about random number generators. Okay? And I should warn you that uh, this is a sort of obsession of mine, and it's getting worse with the years and not better. Um, so uh, random numbers are discussed in chapter 29, and then I'm going to talk to you about uh, normal random numbers, and then we'll talk about log normality. And all the time we're going to be doing simulations, and all of this is, one, I want you to understand the nature of randomness. I don't think that's possible, by the way, and I'll explain to you why, but at least you should understand that you don't understand anything. That's a, a good start. And the second thing is um, I want to talk about the binomial model going to Black and Scholes, and then next week, hopefully, I can start talking about Monte Carlo uh, methods for options that can't be solved analytically. So Asian options and barriers. So that's sort of the agenda for today. This is a, um, a presentation which is not on my website. I actually, I had a lot of time in the last 24 hours. I wrote it in the last 24 hours. Um, so it'll be on the website sometime tonight or tomorrow. But of course, it accompanies the chapter in the book. OK, so here's the first question. What's a random number? I tried to think about some examples, but maybe you have some examples. So um, the most obvious, most simple example of random numbers is you toss a coin, and you decide that heads is plus 1 and minus 1 is tails. That's sort of a classic example. Or uh, you could toss a die. You know what a die is, kubia in Hebrew? Um, and you know that comes up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Or you could talk about uniform random numbers. We're going to be very busy discussing uniform random numbers because they're really the basis for most of the things that we're going to do. And uh, I assume you know what a uniform distribution is, but our uniform random numbers will be numbers between 0 and 1. And I'll show you how Excel and VBA deal with that problem. And then you could think about multidimensional random numbers. So uh, a uniform random number is a number on the, on the x-axis, if you like. But you can think about two-dimensional random numbers, which a two-dimensional random number would look like this. There would be a random number. That's the x. And then there would be another random number. That's the y. And maybe both of these are uniform. And then you graph them. OK, so this is 1, and this is 1. We'll play with some of these numbers. So here's the number x, y. OK, so those are random numbers, stock returns. Uh, the, the Black Shoals, where did I come from at all this? I came from, 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 from Black and Shoals, because last week I showed you what are the conditions for Black and Shoals. So the first condition of Black and Shoals is suppose that the stock return is log normally distributed with mean and sigma, or actually Black and Shoals just assumes sigma. So that turns out also to be uh, an assumption about random numbers, and, I, and that's what I'm going towards. And if anybody else has an interesting example, anybody have an interesting, simple example of a random number? Yeah? So on, um, on Excel, the, the random function is, we say that it's, uh, for 99% of the people in the, the world, it's probably random enough, but for us it may, may not be. Oh, I'll talk about that. 
I'll talk about that. I'm actually looking right now for just sort of idiot examples. You know, maybe you can flip two coins. Maybe that's, that's also a random number, right? Okay. So that's a random, these are random numbers. So what's a random number generator? Okay? So there was a very famous mathematician at Berkeley, a man named Derek Lamer. Um, I put a little um, thing here about the website. Uh, Derek was married to a Russian lady named Emma, and they were both famous mathematicians. And uh, just interesting to see what people do for a living as mathematicians. They have a little website uh, devoted to them. It's, it's interesting. Um, so, so Lamer, as I'll show you at some point today, is one of the people who invented functions that create random numbers. Okay, now I want you to think about this for a second and see what kind of bullshit I'm dealing with. I'm not supposed to say that on this. Okay, so here, here, here's what I, I want to do. Um, what's a function? So a function, all right, when I was a mathematician, it's a mapping from x to y, but maybe you want to think about a function as being the following. You take some number x, and you put it in a function, and you get y equals f of x. Now, is that random or deterministic? It's completely deterministic. Okay. Now, Lamer invented a set of functions, a whole class of functions, which when you look at them, it looks like the output is random. This, all of this stuff really has to do with God, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, and I'm, I'm only slightly joking. I mean, it's sort of theological. So what's going to happen? What's going to happen in this class is I'm going to show you a function, and you're going to say, Sure, that's unpredictable, right? What does random mean? It means unpredictable or predictable within bounds, right? When you flip a coin, can you predict whether it will come up heads or tails? No. When you throw a dice, a die, can you predict whether it will come up one, two, three, four, five, six? No. Okay? So I have a very complicated coin. It's called rand. And when I flip rand, it's going to come up a number between 0 and 1, and it turns out to be a completely deterministic function. That's weird. Okay? So Lamer, uh, he invented these things. A lot of famous people associated with random number generators. John von Neumann, you know, one of the great mathematicians of the 20th century, he also has his name on this, uh, this field. So Lamer said, a random sequence, think about random numbers, is a vague notion embodying the idea of a sequence in which each term is unpredictable to the uninitiated. Meaning, the person who uses the random number generator in Excel, uh, in just a second I'm going to stop with all this philosophy and I'm going to show you some numbers, okay? But it's the person who uses a random number generator in Excel, what he or she thinks is that the number is not predictable. But it is predictable. Okay? Each term is unpredictable to the uninitiated and whose digits pass a certain number of tests traditional with statisticians and depending somewhat on the uses to which the sequence is to be put. Maybe at the end, <coughs> at the end of this prison, <coughs> Maybe at the end of this presentation, I should show you this again, just to show you how little you understand. Okay? Um, I love Wikipedia. Wikipedia has great mathematical entries and statistical entries. So uh, Wikipedia calls these things pseudo-random number generators. Uh, take your time. I'll post this. Um, and... What it says, again, is what I just told you. A pseudo-random number generator is a deterministic function, but it looks unpredictable. Um, oh, okay, now in Excel, there are at least two basic random number generators. 
there's one in Excel and there's one in VBA, but of course VBA is part of the Excel package. The Excel one is called RAND. It's one of a group of Excel functions that uses open parentheses. Anybody know another Excel function that uses open parentheses? Today. No. What? Today. Today uses open parentheses. Pi uses open parentheses. That means it's just a left parenthesis and a right parenthesis, and there's nothing in between. That's OK? And in VBA, the same function or the same thing is performed by a function called RND. And if you're going to be a programmer, this is not a programming course, you can't use RAND in VBA. You have to, you have to use RND. OK, let's go for a second to my Excel spreadsheet. And okay, so I just stuck this function rand in my Excel spreadsheet, and every time I hit F nine the number changes. Try to guess. What do you think? I'm about to hit F9. This number is 0.53628. It's actually, of course, a little larger. But we won't bother about that, OK? Um, you see, there's a lot of digits here. Um, Excel actually has a digit problem. Ah. You see, one of the problems is every time I change something, it changes. So the current random number is 0.665536. What's the next random number when I push F9? I don't know. Ah, I don't know. I know some things. Could it be 2? No. Could it be minus 4? No. But it's somewhere between 0 and 1, and I hit F9, and you just get all these random numbers. OK. Now, what did Lamer say? Lamer, right? That's my hero of the day. Actually, I have several heroes of the day. Uh, what did Lamer say? Lamer said, well, it's a function. I mean, he knew it was a function because he wrote the damn thing. OK? It's a function, but the uninitiated, that's us can't tell that it's not random. OK, so let's think about designing some tests All right, to see whether a particular number is random. Can, you, can anybody in this class come up with a simple test for randomness? Yes. OK, now I, I don't want to put a 1,000 numbers up, but, but, but um, I like this idea. So here's an idea. Each one of these cells says RAND, and I'll tell you how many there are. There are 234. In uh, OK, so I, 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 your, your suggestion is create 234 of these numbers. What do you want to know? What is the average? What's the average? What should the average be? OK. I'm going to use this notation. It's a great notation. A, A, I don't have to worry about how many points there are. Uh, OK, what's your name? Adam. Adam, so uh, you're the author of this test. Is it random? Frequency. OK, I, I, I'm going to tell you, you know what? OK, let's see. Frequency. What do you mean by frequency? Who said that? Did you say that? 
Okay, frequency. What's your idea here? So a frequency, Excel has a frequency function. And I assume that your idea here is, I don't know, you tell me. What's your idea? That uh, on average, every bean would have uh, two, uh, Okay. We're going to divide 0, 1 into bins. Uh, here's my bin. I do this all over Chapter 29. So let's do them 0, 0 0.1. Okay, we'll make this neat and center it. And now we'll count the frequency. So the idea here is we're going to count how many are between 0 and 0 0.1, how many are between 0 0.1 and, okay? And uh, maybe before I do this, there are 234 of these points. How many do you think should be in each bin? Around 23. Okay, so I have this function. It's called frequency. It's an array function. You take the data array. So the data array is AA, and then you take the bins array. I don't actually need the last bin, but I, I like to do it this way. And now you hit Control Shift Enter. Or oh, I don't need the first one. I can never remember. Okay, so you know what? I'll make it a little more colorful. And I'll make it a graph, and I'll make the graph small. These are the kinds of things I actually do in chapter 29. You're probably going to want to read this chapter when you do your homework. OK, so is that random? Why don't you run more numbers? What? How many do you want me to run? 10,000. Ah, come on. I, in just a second, I'm going to run 10 million, OK? It won't make you much wiser. But you want a few more numbers? I, I, I hate to disappoint students, especially. OK. Are you happy? 1,186. That's too much. Too much. Shh. OK, is that random? Yes? Uh, the average, you have a uniform distribution, so you're going to uh, get to the expectation. Now, wait a minute. How do you know I have a uniform distribution? Because it's between 0 and 1. You have to understand that the, 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 basic, the basic conflict of this whole thing is <clears throat> it looks, let's say, like a uniform distribution, but it's not. It's not a random number of distribution. It's a function. So you could check if you want randomness. You could check a, a correlation between parts in your sequence. If it's random, it's supposed to be close to zero. If it's proper random. No, no. If it's random, what does that mean it's going to be for, close to zero? Oh, the correlation? <coughs> the correlation. OK, that's an interesting thing. I'm not going to do this right now, but that's actually a good comment. So another thing you could do is you could check the correlation. Correlation, in this case, let's not get technical. It means, can I say anything about the next number based on the previous number? How's that? That's one way to think about it. OK. Um, you have a suggestion here? The standard deviation. The standard deviation. Uh, I doubt if that's. Maybe. Something like that. OK. Listen, I want to tell you a story. And then we'll go back and do some of this uh, stuff again. Ah. So uh, here's another one of my heroes for today. Uh, is an Israeli, um, what was he? Who knows? Amos Tversky was a professor at Hebrew University and uh, at Stanford. And he's really 
one of the founders, maybe the founder of a field called mathematical economics. And a couple of years ago, Tversky's co-author, <coughs> another Israeli, Daniel Kahneman, won the Nobel Prize. But in the meantime, unfortunately, Tversky had died. So Tversky is one of these people like, like Fisher Black. You know, if Fisher Black had been alive, then he would have won the Nobel Prize because everybody he worked with won the Nobel Prize. But, so, okay. All right. So here's a story somebody told me about Tversky. Uh, Tversky was trying to make this point that I'm trying to make, which is that we really don't understand randomness. And uh, the story is that he would start his class at Stanford, and he would say, so he had a class, he was a great lecturer, you know, a couple hundred people, and uh, he would come in, and he would say to the class, okay, here's the homework assignment for the next time. If, I need a piece of paper, just as a prop, okay? If you were born on an even date, sorry, on an, I'll keep with this. If you were born on an odd date, so I was born on the 3rd of April, that's me. Um, you're born on an odd date, you go home, you take a piece of paper, and you write the numbers 1, 2, 3, and so on, all the way down to 100, and you take a coin out of your pocket, and for each number you flip the coin and you record the results. Okay? And you come in the next time and you say, Simon, and it says heads, tails, whatever. Okay? That's it. That's your homework uh, for the first class. Now, that's the people who were born on odd days of the month. The people who were born on even days of the month they have a much harder assignment. They also have to come in. They have to put their name on a piece of paper. They have to make a list of 1 to 100. But no coins. You just think about flipping a coin. You close your eyes and you say, tails, for sure. And then you do it again 100 times, OK? And the story that I heard was, thank you, um, that the next time Tversky would come into class, he would gather all the pieces of paper, and he would try to classify students by their birth date by looking at their results. Okay? And <clears throat> how do you tell the difference between the people who imagined coin flips and the people who flipped coins? What's the big difference? The numbers, the sequential... Uh, Absolutely. The number of sequential... The number of runs, okay? What's the difference between the runs generated by people like me who flip coins as opposed to people like you who imagine flipping coins? Who's got more runs? Actually, Actually, I think it's just the other way around. I made up an example. Um, I called the first column honorata after a lady who was my girlfriend about 40 years ago. And, um, and the second column, John, I don't remember who he is. Okay, And John is flipping a coin. Actually, he's flipping an Excel coin. And the Excel coin says... If Rand is bigger than 0.5, then, what did I make it here? Heads, otherwise, tails. Okay? So John is the coin flipper, and Anurata is the, the coin imaginer. And what Tversky claimed is that people don't believe how many runs there are, okay? So John, for example, if you look here, you see down here he's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven tails in a row. You know, Tversky's claim is, Anurata, by the time she got to the third tail, she would say, you know what? It's time for a heads, okay? And in fact, um, I, I, of course, who am I to disagree with with Tversky, 
Okay, here's. I, I'm going to ignore Honorata because I'm I hardwired Honorata. I just made this up. But uh, John here, you see, he's got all these things. Okay, and you know, every time I hit F9, I get a different set of results. I don't think I have a hundred here, but if you look here, so look at this. Here's another one. Six heads in a row. Okay, who would have believed six heads in a row? It's hard to believe. And so one of Tversky's basic claims was we don't understand randomness. And the more, I have to tell you, the more games I play with randomness, whether it's this kind of stuff or um, log normal simulations, which I'm going to do in a little while, I, I'm more and more convinced of this. I, I just don't understand. Actually, there's a law about these runs. Okay, um, I think I have a slide about this in another chapter. And the law is, it's a statistical law. It's called the arc sine law. Okay, and um, in, in, in sort of common language, the law says that runs are much more common than alternate results. Okay? So if you, for example, let's play another little game. You know, it's great stuff for games, this stuff. Okay? Let's suppose that we play a game with John, and the game works like this. So here's my game. The game is like this. If John throws a head, John throws the coin. If John throws a head, then he gets, I pay him one dollar or shekel. And if John throws a tail, he pays me one. Okay? Uh, we used to play this game when I was in high school. We would go into the boys' bathroom of the high school. I studied in Asheville, North Carolina. And we would flip coins. I don't think we played for dollars. We used the bathroom for three things. One is the obvious thing. The second one was to play this game. And the third one was to smoke. And if you got caught doing either of the latter two and you were a man, then you would get uh, beaten. Uh, so it was very exciting, actually. Um, so here's the way this game works. So it says, if Rand is bigger than 0.5, then 1 and otherwise minus 1. We'll just see that this. OK? Now, that's not the game. The game that I'm interested in is how much money did John win after 100 coin flips? OK? So the next one is the previous one plus the same thing. If Rand bigger than 0.5, 1, minus 1. So that's his cumulative winnings. OK? All right, so you see this? I've got this. Um, here, there's only 25. Oh, OK. Now, tell me something about this cumulative winnings. What's the average? I see none of you have been in bathrooms lately where this game is. What? Zero. OK. Huh? No, well, if, you, if I gave this to you on a statistics exam, I said, what's the average winnings you would, if you just said anything but zero, I would take off points, right? OK. Who's ahead most of the time, me or John? Yeah, I mean, listen, what is, your, what is the model you have in your head for the winnings? I flip a coin, he flips a coin, I flip a coin, blah, 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 blah. OK, at any given time, approximately, either one of us has zero, right? But that's not true. 
That's the problem with this stuff. You just don't know what you're talking about. I mean, so. Um, uh, you know, it's going to be zero eventually, but you could go to one million and minus one million back. No? Yeah, the, the, the arc sine law actually says much deeper stuff than that. Okay, so here, watch. You see this? Just watch. I'm just hitting. Okay, the arc sine law says that most of the time one person is ahead. It doesn't say, by the way, who's ahead. Okay, but it says stuff like, here, you see this? Who would have believed this? I'm a genius. Or he's a genius. I can't remember which one this is. All right, um, so you have to be. You have to be really, really careful when you have random numbers. Okay, so uh, I'll show you something else. What do you mean? We're talking about the average, no? No, the average is zero. But I asked a different question now. I said, who's ahead most? Who's ahead? And your intuition is, what? Yeah, but, but this wasn't your intuition. I, I, I mean, I, you know what, maybe you're... Maybe this was. Why should I tell you what you were thinking? I think most people, when they see this game, what they say is, if I take the cumulative winnings, it sort of bounces around zero. Isn't that what you were thinking? Sometimes you win, sometimes I win. You know, the, the sum is about zero. But in fact, that's not true. What happens is, you have these amazing runs. Look at the, you know what? You see what happened here? Sorry, I'm not supposed to do this. And I, you see what happened here? Somebody kept winning. Okay? Of course, when I reverse that, you know, here somebody kept losing. All right? Um, sure. What? The arc sine law, I, 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 it says that this is actually what you would expect, that in these random number games, somebody, the, 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 the cumulative result will show that there are a huge number of runs and that one person is ahead most of the time. So this, this thing that you have in your head that says that it's approximately even is actually the least likely result. Okay, let me show you. Did you have a question? Yeah, it's supposed to be even when, when you try it a million times. In 25 times you play it, you know what? A million is a little hard to do in Excel. Yeah, I understand. But in theory, the, the But you've got 16,000. Go home and do it. Okay, let me tell you about another one of my heroes. I have a lot of names today that you may not have heard. So there's, there's Lemur. And there was Tversky. Most Israelis have heard of Tversky. Here's another person um, who's a hero of mine. Um, he's actually Lebanese originally, Nassim Taleb. And he's written a ver number of books. Um, my favorite Nassim Taleb book is a book called, um, what is it called? Yeah. Fooled by Randomness. He's a, he's a very interesting guy, and he's become very well-known, so well-known. This is a true story. I sat with him about a year ago in a, in a coffee shop in New York. You've been to New York? Grand Central Station? You've been to Grand Central Station? On the north side of Grand Central Station, there's a, a, a huge cafe called the Pershing Cafe. It's like under a bridge. There's an overpass. So I was having a cup of coffee with, uh, with Nassim Taleb, and um, at, the, at the end of, you know, sort of when we were paying the bill, um, I think he paid. He makes a lot more than I do. And um, the, the waitress came up to him and said, you're Nassim Taleb, right? And he said, yes. He was happy. I was, of course, inwardly very... Uh, 
you know, I've written books too. I mean, why should you be known? Anyway, um, so um, but he's a very, very nice guy. So she said, yes, I know all about you. I know your picture. I own all your books. It turns out that she was a, uh, an MBA student at Baruch College, which is a large business school in, in New York. Anyway, so Nassim Taleb, he has his book called Fooled by Randomness. And it's about these kinds of phenomena that I was just showing you, these runs. And I like this book so much that I made up a, um, a PowerPoint simulation. Actually, I'm waiting for some really clever person to do a PowerPoint for me. Um, so in the meantime, I just used all of my considerable artistic talents to create this, um, uh, this drawing. Okay? So in... In this, but it has a serious purpose. Uh, this, again, has to do with you don't really know what randomness is. So in this drawing, we have a physical model. In physics, sometimes we talk about pistons. A piston is a kind of chamber, and sometimes it has a push thing in the bottom. Um, and in this chamber, there are molecules of gas and... Um, in my piston, there are molecules of gas. There's actually a very famous physical law from the early part of the early third of the 19th century called Brown's Law. This is called Brownian motion. And what we know about these molecules is they keep hitting each other. And the statistics of how they hit each other and where they are is predictable. But of course, the actual place is not predictable. Okay, but in my piston, there's a little hole at the top. You see it? And every once in a while, a molecule escapes from the hole, and standing right outside the hole is a newspaper reporter. And he interviews the molecule. Okay, and the question is, what does the molecule say to the newspaper reporter? So what does the molecule say? Well, the molecule says, you know what? I was in this piston. I had a strategy. I knew there must be a way out. You know, I tried it, and here I am. My strategy works. Okay? And then the newspaper reporter says, um, so, so you're going to tell me about this? He says, no, no, no. He says, first of all, the strategy is so complicated you wouldn't understand it. And second of all, I'm writing a book about this, and if I tell you this, you'll put it in your newspaper, and no one will buy copies of the book. But this all has to do with this fact that random numbers are they are surprising, and you don't really understand them. Okay, I'll, that's a point I wanted to make. Um, let's see. Okay, so I showed you this, right? You see, here's, here's this gas molecule. Here's this person who says, you know what? I knew exactly how to play this coin flipping game. I'll sell you the secret for $25 or euros or whatever, and I'll show you how to win. I have a winning strategy. The truth is, I won. Okay. Um, all right, now, I, I, was, I was at this point where I was saying to you, what's... What's a test, right? According to Lamer, these random number generators, you have to have a test, and it has to pass tests. All right? So the way to think about this is how would I, not how would I prove that it's random, but how would I prove that it's not random? Okay, let's think in that direction. All right? So, for example, let's start with this. What would convince you here that it's not random. No. What? It always passes the test, but I don't know what that means, always passes the test. Let me, let me tell you the kind of thing I'm thinking of, and then you'll say, oh, yes, that's what I meant. Listen, suppose you looked at these bars, and suppose one of the bars was always taller than the other bar. Okay, then you would say, you know what, that can't be random because a basic test of randomness is that if I throw a coin 50,000 times, it should be sort of even. Well, if it's uniform. Okay, so 
you know, if you look at this and you see that the place of the highest bar keeps changing, okay, could be. But if the highest bar is in the same place, then it's not random. Okay? All right. Tell me another test, but tell me a two-dimensional test. What would be a two-dimensional test? What? What? Yes. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do this. We're going to insert. Uh, we'll do it at the end. So we'll do a two-dimensional test. And we'll put random numbers in the first. And we'll put random numbers in the second. And we'll create as many of these things as you want. I think that's enough. And now we're going to create a scatter graph. Now, when I do a scatter graph, Excel puts the first column on the x-axis and the second column on the y-axis. Um, and there are a lot of points here. OK. What would convince you that this is not random? Uh, what? OK. If you had, you see how I have some, some white space here? Yeah. Yeah. All right. If you had the same place, approximately, the white space was always there, then you would say, aha, uh -huh, there's a screw up here. OK? But if you look at this, you'll see that that's not true. There's white spaces. It looks a little bit like a Rorschach test, for those of you who have gone that route in life. Um, OK? But it's always different. And in fact, there's a very famous story about random number gen random number generators are used extensively in finance, but also extensively in physics. So actually, uh, the whole concept of Monte Carlo has to do with making atomic bombs, strangely enough. Um, uh, there was a, a, a mathematician named Stanley Ulam, and um, he worked on this. in the Second World War. And it turned out that there were many, many things that they couldn't get a, a numerical, so, an, an analytical solution to. Uh, an analytical solution means you have an equation that you solve, like Black and Scholes. OK? We also have things like that. We have barrier options or Asian options, no analytical solutions. And so Stanley Ulam made up this concept of Monte Carlo, which I will explain to you next week. And in physics, this is pretty widely used. And there's a story which is on this slide. It's sort of down here. And it says that Monte Carlo methods were widely used. And there was a very famous random number generator called Randu. And it turned out that when you did one of these multi-dimensional tests, not, not two dimensions, that's too obvious, but let's say 16 dimensions. You know, I don't know even what, does anybody know what 16 dimensions looks like? I mean, OK. But if you did a 16-dimensional test on this random number generator, it turned out that the same area tended to be white. So there was sort of an area missing. OK? So that's a test of non-randomness. All right? Any other tests of non-randomness? Well, how about this? Another test of non-randomness is, is there a cycle? OK, now I can't show you this in Excel. OK, but so here's the idea. You take the rand random number generator from Excel, and you create one, and then you create another, and you create another, and you create another, OK? At some point, 
it turns out that you will get back to the number that you started with. Okay? All of these random number generators that we have cycle. So um, that shows that it's not, we're not God. You know, God knows how to really produce random numbers. Okay? God produced several, I will talk about God in just a second, and random numbers. Um, but, so if there is a cycle, it's not really random. But in our case, the cycle for rand is very, very large. And so you don't really notice it. Okay, so here's my last question, and then I'll move on to more practical stuff. Even though this turns out to be very practical, um, what are the two random numbers that you can think about created by God? What random numbers did... What? Okay. Pi. E is another one. Now, what does that mean? Actually, God, it turns out, created more random numbers than he created non-random numbers. Okay? Why is that? Well... What's a rational number? That can be divided by two integers. Okay, one way to think, to think about a rational number is it's a fraction. What's another way to think about a rational number? What happens in the digits of a rational number? What? There's a pattern. There's a cycle. And there's a pattern in the digits. So pi, is pi rational? No. no. So is there a pattern in the digits? No. no. If there were, it would be rational. So if you take the digits of pi any way you want, you take the digits one at a time. Three point, you don't start with three. One, four, one, five, nine. Nine. But take the digits two at a time if you want two-digit random numbers. Take the digits three at a time, okay? The same thing with E, okay? How many rational numbers are there? Huh? Aleph. How many irrational numbers are there? Hmm? Aleph one, right? What's bigger, Aleph one or Aleph? There's a proof that says that this number is much bigger than this number. Okay? So, in fact, the world is full of irrational numbers, and, and irrational numbers are, I guess, random number generators, and you only have to know how to pick them. Okay? So, this is a very weird field. Okay. So, I know I've spouted on for much too long, so let me just show you some Excel. So uh, here's a lot of random numbers in a block. I already told you about Nassim, and I told you about uh, Tversky. Um, In the spreadsheet that comes with chapter 29, I have a number of small VBA programs that create random numbers. Okay? So here's a VBA program. It creates 10 random numbers, and all it does, again, it's not a programming course, but all it does is it takes this list of 10 and it puts RND in each one. Every time you click this, the hidden behind this little box is uh, uh, a thing that works the macro. Okay. Um, I already showed you this. This is our thing. Okay, here's one. Here's another one I wrote. Um, I can't do more than a couple of thousand random numbers on the spreadsheet itself, but I can use Excel to create as many of these things as I want. So um, here is, this is already the output. This is the output of creating 10 a million random numbers. So when I hit this, 
it's going to take like two seconds. OK? Actually, what this does is it sorts them straight into the bins. All right? And one of the things you see, first of all, look at the bins. If you're worried about whether this is even or not, OK, uh, don't look at the bars. Look at the numbers, and you'll see that they're all very close together. Excel sort of exaggerates the size of the bins. Um, I, I used to do these things. I used to put in timers. Uh, so I have a little timer here that takes uh, that shows uh, how long it takes Excel to or VBA to do this. Um, but my computer is getting faster and faster, so I used to do this with 10,000 10 years ago when I first wrote this, uh, or 15 years ago. And now I need 10 million to produce a significant time. Because if I put in you know, 1 million, that's a lot of random numbers, right? Oh, it takes one second or something. Um, what else can I do? You Ah, here's another thing. We're going to talk about functions in just a second. Let me tell you about pseudo-random random, pseudo -random number generators. So. OK, now what's the point? The point here is you think you know what a random number is, although I know that you don't know. OK? But what I'm about to show you is something which you can't prove is not random, but it's not random. Hence the word pseudo. Looks like, but it isn't. OK? So all pseudo random number generators have the following kind of form. This is a general form. You start. with some initial initial number. This is usually called the seed. And then you have a rule. And that rule produces the random number. And then you use this random number as the seed. Get the idea? It just goes on. You, you start with a seed, 2. And then you have a rule that produces a random number. And then you use the random number as a seed. And you produce your next random number. So uh, let me give you the simplest example I know. Suppose, suppose you could generate pi to any degree of accuracy that you wanted. Um, I'll talk about that, too, next time. I have a lot of this. OK, never mind. I, I'll show you a function that generates pi to an amazing number of digits, let's say 10 billion. Okay. Now, we know that the digits of pi are random, because if they weren't random, pi wouldn't be a, uh, an irrational number. So the seed would say, start with digit 52. And the rule would say, take the next digit. That's a random number generator. Okay? Now, in Excel, you can tell it to use the same seed, and then it will generate the same random numbers. Or you can say to it, randomize the seed, which is what we usually do, and then every time it produces different random numbers. Okay? So in this particular spreadsheet, I have embedded two programs. One is called random each different. And it produces output in column B. And the other one is called 
random the same, and it starts with this seed. And as long as I don't change that seed, the numbers in the first column won't change. So here, I'll show you. I'm going to hit random each different and look at column B. It's only producing 10 numbers. Oh, sorry. Look at column A. OK? So every time I hit this, column A is the same. Every time I hit this, column B doesn't change because I didn't change the seed. But if I change the seed to 123, it will change. Why would I want to produce the same list of random numbers over and over? Yes? Maybe you use a simulation and you have some sort of phenomenon you're testing and it happens only to a certain random. Yeah, uh, maybe what I want to do is I want to say, I know the world is random, but let me take a particular random sequence and price the option. And I'll price it this way, and I'll price it that way. So I'm interested in keeping the same seed. OK? So Excel has that capability. Um, I think I'm actually through. Yeah, I don't want to talk about this yet. OK, in the, 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 this, this presentation, I give you the, um, um, the, the programs, but of course you have the book. I'll just say one more thing that, so that I don't have to talk in the next chapter about this too much. Um, so far, we've only talked about producing standard random numbers, OK, or uniform random numbers between 0 and 1. But Lots of times I'm interested in producing random numbers which have different distributions. So for example, Black-Scholes says, suppose that the returns are normally generated. Or suppose the prices are log normal. That's the same thing. Okay. So in order to do this, you need to produce normally distributed numbers. So there are lots of, and that's of course a very, very common problem in finance and in physics. So there are lots of programs that produce normally distributed numbers. Here's one that's very popular. It's called the Box-Muller routine. I just gave you part of this. What it does is it does the following. You take a, ran sorry, oh. you take a random number, R and D, and you multiply this random number by 2 and subtract 1. What does that do? OK. R and D is between 0 and 1. How about 2 R and D minus 1? Where is that? What? Be careful. It's between minus 1 and plus 1. OK? So the, the starting step of Box-Muller is you take two random numbers and you create two numbers which are between 0 and 1. So where are they, these numbers? They are, so here's plus 1, minus 1, plus 1 minus 1, you just created a number here. And then the next step is, it's a step that's called S1. You square each number and subtract, or oh, sorry, you just square each number. OK? What does that do? OK. What you're going to test is you're going to test That's my way of drawing a unit circle inside of a unit square. This touches this. Okay? What you're going to do is you're going to test if it's inside the unit circle, in which case rand 1 squared plus rand 2 squared is less than 1. Or maybe it's outside the unit circle. 
Okay? So the test says the test says if it's outside the unit circle, start over. If it's inside the unit circle, do something. And that will give you two random numbers, x1 and x2. And x1 and x2 are normally distributed. Now, again, you know, Box and Mueller, they were two well-known mathematicians. Again, the question is, is that really true? And, you know, you have to test it. And again, the test is never going to be an absolute test. The test is going to be, can I think of things that if they are violated, I would say it's not normally distributed? Okay, well, this is a very common random number generator. Okay. Um, I already talked about this. Ah, this is going to be part of my homework. Um, I'm going to ask you in the homework, the homework problem, to throw a die and record the results. Okay, now how am I going to record the results? What I'm going to do is I'm going to use VLOOKUP. So, can you follow me? I'm going to use VLOOKUP, and uh, here's my lookup table. If the, if the random number falls between 0 and 1 sixth, I'm going to give 1. If it falls between 1 sixth and 2 sixths, I'm going to get 2. Okay? So that says VLOOKUP, RAND, here's the table, column 2, and I'm going to produce a whole list of these random numbers. So this is random results of a die. I hope they're random. Okay. Again, you could check. And um, I computed for you two things. I computed for you the actual mean and the standard deviation of the sample. And I computed for you, I actually did the computation. What's, it's a good thing I had a long flight today, okay? Um, what's the average, so the average is three and a half, and what's the variance, and what's the standard deviation. Um, and, you know, every time I, there's a spreadsheet here, every time I press F9, I'm going to get different numbers. Um, of course, I can, I, if RAND is a good random number generator, I can simulate a die Throwing a die, I can simulate throwing two die, or 22. I can do anything. I'm God. No, I mean, God is, but never mind. You understand. Okay, so I want to show you one more thing, um, and that's how these functions work, and that's going to be part of your homework. Okay, so these, these functions that create random numbers, are, they're many methods. The ones that are used in Excel are called congruence methods, and they're due to this uh, uh, mathematician named uh, Lamer. And um, here's something that I'm going to ask you to do for your homework. All right, so um, here's an exercise from the book. You start with some number, and then you create x1 equals the seed plus pi, and x2 is x5 plus the lan looks horrible. Looks horrible. Uh, as I said, but I always, never mind. You start with a seed, then you create an x1 and an x2, and you take the random number is the non-integer part. It's the fractional part of your result of this x2. Okay? And then you go and you do it again. That's what I said. These things, they're sort of circular arguments. Okay, and uh, I'm going to say to you, well, use this thing to produce a list of 50 random numbers. Just play around with it a little bit. Um, here's another one. This is more the, the, the thing that Lamer used. It, it's the same kind of idea, but um, this works on uh, mod. Mod is what happens. It's the remainder when you divide one number by the other. Excel has that function. So I'm going to ask you to... Uh, to do some of these things. I'm also going to send you to the Bible of functions. 
The Function Bible is a book by um, two people, Mr. Abramovitz and Ms. Stegen, uh, published in 1972. It's completely online. The copyright has run out. I give you a reference somewhere. And um, Abramovitz and Stegen give, it's, it's, a, it's about functions. They give many, 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 many functions. But they have a whole section on random number functions. And so you can, you can sort of play around with that and um, create some random numbers. And finally, uh, I found somewhere on the web something about how Excel creates random numbers. Basically, it's not much different from these congruence things, except in creating, instead of creating one, they take create three and they average them. No big deal. OK, it's 8.15. Can I trust you to be back here in 10 minutes? OK, let's stop. Talk about randomness. Now I'm going to talk about log normality. OK, so shh. the basic assumption of the Black and Scholes model is that the stock price is log normally distributed, which means that the returns on the stock, when you define them in continuous terms, are normally distributed. And I want to talk a little bit about what that means. I want to tell you about how to simulate it. And it's going to be the basis for our binomial simulations. Um, could somebody close that door? Thank you. All right, well, I already told you about Amos Tversky, and I told you about runs. And, and in this chapter, or in this, um, in this PowerPoint, I also have a slide or two about the arc sine law, if you want to learn about that. OK. Now, let's talk, first of all, about how to simulate a normal number. OK? The, um, the slang. is normal deviant. So well, statistics is one of the few fields in which someone who is a deviant, which you know is not usually considered a compliment, is normal. Um, and uh, I showed you Box Muller in the previous uh, set of slides. And what I'm going to show you now is a very simple technique for creating, I hope, creating normal numbers. And the technique uses an Excel function called norm s inverse. All right? So what are you seeing on this slide? What you see is the cumulative distribution. Right? Cumulative means the total area under the curve. So here's the standard normal curve. Take an x, that, that whole area here is the cumulative. And of course, the cumulative starts, it starts from 0 because you start at minus infinity, and it goes up to 1. So this cumulative curve, it has that nice S shape. There is 1. It, of course, never touches 1. And here is 0 0.5 at 0. OK. So usually what you do is you, give, you take a number. Right? You read, let's say, x equals 1. You go up to this curve, and you get, I can't remember. We did it last week, 0 0.8, <coughs> 0 0.86, something like that. <coughs> Now what we're going to do is we're going to reverse directions. We're going to start with a random point between 0 and 1. And we're going to go in this direction. We're going to see where we hit the curve. And then we're going to see which x that produces. And the Excel function that does that is norm 
S inverse. So here's the claim, and we'll talk about this claim in just a second. The claim is that if you take lots of norm S inverses of Rand, then these things will be normally distributed. Actually, they're going to be standard normally distributed. Standard normally distributed means <clears throat> Mu equals zero, sigma equals one. All right, let's see how that looks when we implement it. So, I'll take a spreadsheet. I'll put in get formula, and I'll just create a whole bunch of these numbers. Okay, so norm s inverse rand <coughs> how many do you want? That's enough. Okay, now remember, it's random, whatever that means. Okay, so you can't predict it. And not only that, every time I hit F9, I get a different set of rands, so I get a different set of enormous inverse of rands. Okay, now we can ask lots of questions about this. Let me just do the most simple, basic, obvious, idiotic thing, which is what? Let's do a frequency distribution and see if it looks normal. Okay, so um, I'm going to create bins. Now, normal numbers don't usually go below minus four. Now, well, before I do this, let's just do some really stupid stuff. Like, what's the max and what's the min? Okay, you see that, ah, did you see there was one there that was four or something? You'll see, every once in a while a four pops up. Because that's life. That means that we're just about to have a stock market crash or something like that. Okay, so I'm going to do my bins, I'm going to do like this. I'm going to go from minus four, and in order not to make this too large, let me go minus four, minus 3.9. And then I'm going to run this all the way down to four. And then I'm going to, in this next column, this is my, it's my frequency distribution, but it's actually just going to count. I'm going to say frequency all right, I have to say the data array. So the data array is A. And then I have to say the bins. And now I'm going to use the Excel scatter plot. This is hard stuff, right? Here we go again. 
is this normally distributed? Oh, it sort of looks normal, you know, but it's got little peaks. Again, the question always is, how would you decide that this didn't work? In theory, the theory is perfect. If RAND is really between 0 and 1, randomly, uniformly distributed, then if norm S invert, a lot of ifs here, is correctly computed in Excel, then this should be normally distributed. But take a couple of hundred numbers. Now, just to put this in proportion, when we do stock returns, so let's go back to the first problem I ever gave you here with 10 stocks. Okay, so a typical finance stock return problem says, give me 60 months of data. Okay, so 60 months of data, is that normally distributed? Yes or no? Is it random? Yes or no? Heaven only knows. It's really a, 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 an item of faith. Okay, if somebody came to me and, and turned in a dissertation and said, I have 1,057 monthly returns for IBM. How many years is that? That's about 90 years. I would say to him, you know what? Just throw it into the garbage can and start over, okay? Because there's no chance that that data is believable. Things change. Okay, so you get the idea, this, this thing about is it random, is it not random, is it normal, is it not normal? That's a big uh, uh, a problem. I don't know, looks sort of normal to me. That's sort of where I'm starting out today. Okay, here's another way to think about this. This was actually part of your homework. Okay, here I took McDonald's monthly stock price. Sorry, these are daily returns. Daily returns for 10 years. I have 2,500 and something daily returns, and I made the bins. It sort of looks like a bell curve. Is it normal or not? What's, what's one way to do a normality test on this besides sort of looking at it? Okay, you could use the Excel functions Excel has two functions that are nice. One is called skew, and the other one is called kurtosis. Okay, kurtosis measures whether there are more points in the tails than you would expect from a normal distribution. Actually, it measures not only if there are more points in the tails, but it can also measure if there is more in the center than you would expect from a normal distribution. All right, I've written a little thing on kurtosis and skewness. It's on my website. You'll have to ask me for a login. Maybe I'll create, no, just ask. You don't have to read it. I have, um, for this book, I have a, a, a special website that has extra materials. And anybody who wants that gets a, a login and then I get your name forever and you get my junk mails. That's the deal. So um, I have a little paper on there about measuring skewness and kurtosis. The usual, so skewness, kurtosis is, is it heavy-tailed? Skewness is, is it symmetric? This looks, McDonald's looks pretty symmetric. It doesn't, by the way, have to be symmetric around zero because I assume that McDonald's has a positive daily return on average, right? It's a pretty good stock. So the question is, is it symmetric around something? All right, this looks pretty symmetric to me. What is uh, the tail? What? what is, how does it move? The tail is the, is the stuff out here. So what is heavy-tailed? Heavy-tailed means, heavy -tailed means more at the ends than you would expect from a normal distribution. But that has to be defined. There are statistical measures, yes. 
Okay. Uh, here it is for uh, the S&P 500. Here I went completely bananas, and I took 55 years of data. But this is monthly data. Usually what people say about stock returns is that they are somewhat heavy-tailed. There are more in the positive and negative tails than you would expect from a normal distribution. My friend Nassim Taleb says something else about stock returns. He says that if you get a point down here, then you're pretty likely to get another point down here. Okay? That's not supposed to happen. If in a, in a, a random coin flip, whether it's a normal coin flip or a, a, a uniform coin flip, one coin flip isn't supposed to predict another coin flip. Okay? But we know that stock prices aren't quite like that, right? So once, once Bear Stearns goes under, what's the probability that another investment bank will go under? Is that higher or lower than you thought it was going to be? Well, it's probably higher. So what Nassim Taleb says is he says, given the fact that you, you picked a point out here, the fact that you're going to get another point out here is probably higher than you thought. So there's all kinds of weird stuff. We're not quite sure. He's certainly, he's a, a pretty good mathematician. But uh, he's not quite sure about how to model this. All right? But so there's weird stuff that goes on. I just want to make you aware of the fact that the Black-Scholes model doesn't make any of these assumptions. The Black-Scholes model would say to you, if you get a minus 4% return in a particular month, then the probability that you'll get another minus 4% return is very, very small because they're independent events. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, now, here's another thing. Here are daily returns. Um, it looks like this. Oh, okay. Now, let's talk about simulations. Okay. How are you going to simulate? This is the basic thing that we're going to do um, in in our Monte Carlo processes, how are you going to simulate a log normal price process? And I'm going to give you the equations, and then I'm going to go straight to uh, Excel. Okay, so here is the equation. A stock price is log normally distributed and I'm going to simulate this over intervals delta. Think about delta as being a day. There are about 250 days in a year, 250 business days in a year. So think about delta as being 1 over 250, which is 0 0.004. But of course, it could be a month. It could be a year. I'm also going to use years, by the way, especially in the binomial model. Talk about that later. All right. So what happens? S0 is the first or today's stock price. S1 is the day one price. And S1 is going to be S0 times X mu delta. Did I use delta T there? Oh, let me use delta T. Keep it the same. Plus sigma square root of delta T times Z, and Z is going to be a standard normal random number. So for my next trick, I'm going to implement this so you see what I'm talking about.
So here is my standard, uh, here is my log normal price process. Okay, first I need some data. So I need to know what is mu. I don't know, what's the average annual, this is all in annual terms. So it's the annual average return. What would you say is the average annual return <coughs> for the S&P 500? Yearly. Um, <coughs> eight or nine percent is, is typical of a number. If you want to get really scientific, there's a famous piece of research by Mayer and Prescott that says that the long-term real return on the stock market is 6.8 percent. And then you have to add to that the anticipated inflation. Let's say it's three percent be 9.8 percent. You know what? Let's take 10 percent just to keep things simple. Sigma. Okay, what's the standard deviation of the stock market? Well, that depends on the period, but typically what people uh, use is numbers like 15 to 25 percent. So let's use 20 percent. Okay, and what's delta T? Okay, I said I was going to use 1 over 250. Because I'm going to do a daily simulation. Okay, now let me use a, a, an Excel trick. Let me go and mark this whole area and do control shift F3. I think I showed you this before, but um, it gives the names of the cells on the right. It gives the, the, the names in the column on the left of the cells on the right, or anything else I want to do. So now I've got these as names. Um, so now let's take day. We'll take 0, 1. I know there's a better way to do this, but I forgot how to do this. And, so we'll just go all the way up to 250. Okay. Um, here's what I want you to, to, to think. In this column, I'm going to create a list of normal deviates, these Zs. And I'm going to use the function I showed you before. Sorry. The first day, zero times zero doesn't have one. Norm S inverse Rand I, I, I don't want to use get formula because I want to put my stock price in the next formula, the next um, column. Okay, so let's start with a stock whose price is 25. So this is S0. And let's see what would its price be according to this simulation one day afterwards, depending on two things, depending on the mean and the day, three things. Sorry, the mean, the standard deviation, the day, I guess that's four things, and the random deviate. Okay, so we're going to do this. We're going to take the previous price times x mu times delta t plus sigma times square root of delta t times the randomness. Everything else is fixed. Sorry. Okay, and now I can just copy. Um, maybe I'll make it a little neat. Ooh. 
Okay, so now I'm going to create a graph. So this is my basic stock price simulation. I'm going to create a graph. I'm going to put the days and the x-axis. I'm pushing on control because I'm skipping a column. I hope this works. It's a long way back up to zero. We're almost there. One more month. I did it. And now insert, scatter. You know what? I want to make these little points a little smaller so we get a finer graph. OK, I'm not going to work. What? The Z. Z is norm S inverse. OK, so here's my first simulation of a stock price. This is the basis of Black and Scholes. What does Black and Scholes say? Black and Scholes says this is the way you create a normal simulation of a stock price. I just did it. Every time I push F9, OK? So, you know, by the way, this doesn't look very dramatic. So the way to make this look a little more dramatic is to say, let me go into the y-axis, and let me format this axis. It's not likely that the stock price will dip below 15. If it does, I'm going to, you'll see what happens. OK? So now I'm doing this from 15. Oh, OK. Let's think about this for a second. By the way, one of the things I used to teach an options course at Wharton, one of the things I would do is I would show people how to do this with a little less detail. And then I would say to them, go home and run a simulation and print one out and do some technical analysis. OK? So explain the stock price for me. Um, and I have got great answers. So for example, in technical analysis, there's something, I need this, uh, there's something called head and shoulders. You know, it looks like this. Uh, there's also an inverse head and shoulders, which looks like this. So for example, almost every simulation has a head and shoulders. I see one here, you see? That is the, the left shoulder, there's the head. Uh, this guy is sort of a little crooked. Um, you know, you can have trends. Um, you can have support lines. You see, there's a support line right here at about 28. The support line means if it's not going to go below 28, then it's going to stay above 28. Um, you have to get used to saying these kinds of things. You know, there's a ceiling. You know, 34 is a ceiling. Um, this all goes back to, you know, sort of, Nassim Taleb, and yes, I knew it was going to, the guy with the molecule, interviewing the molecule, I knew this was going to happen, okay? But trust me, this is like totally random. Not only is it completely random, every once in a while you get an amazing crash. You see this? That's not even such an amazing crash. You can get, if you push, if you have enough patience and you push enough times, you will get all kinds of, of of garbage here. Usually what I do when I say this kind of, when I show people this kind of thing, I say, listen, what's the point about the Black and Scholes assumption of log normality? The point of this is that whatever the, it means in technical terms, the stock price patterns it produces look like the kinds of things you see in a newspaper. Now, that's a very weak argument for saying that something is true. And Many people have, in fact, attacked that argument. But 
I think it's sort of convincing, right? This is, what's, this is what asset prices tend to look like. Um, okay, let's just do one or two sanity tests on this. So, for example, if the standard deviation is zero, what's this going to look like? Actually, it, Excel does some tricks here. It shouldn't be straight. It should be, it should be sort of a mild curve. What it really is is a bond that has a fixed increment every day. Okay? And because there is compound interest, it should have a, a sort of curvature. But Excel gets rid of that curvature. Okay? Um, here's 20%. What if I raise the standard deviation to 50%. Hmm? One is it's going to be higher, which is strange, but there's a theory there. But what's the most immediate effect going to be? It's going to be more jumpy. Okay? <laughs> uh, in fact, it jumped straight through the x-axis here. Okay? It's more spiky. That's what volatility does to you. Okay? By the way, I was talking before about running a random number generator when you keep the same random numbers. This is a time when I'd probably want to do that so I could say, listen, the uncertainty is the same, but I get more spikiness with higher volatility. Okay. I think that's actually all I want to do here. Let me just see. Because I have to move on, right? Um, ah, I, I'm going to do this for you. Uh, I'm going to put this in as a as a as a homework problem. Excel has uh, a data analysis package that's built right in. Data analysis allows me to generate a series of random numbers. You don't have to go through VBA, and it keeps them there, so I can do these experiments a little better. Um, and you've got the book, and it's explained in the book, and here it's explained also. Um, all right, I gave you this for homework, and I assumed that this was part of any course that you had as a prerequisite, but um, I assume you all know how to compute the mean and the variance of a log normal process uh, from price data. Is that right? Yes. All right, here I took. Um, Kroger, and I took uh, um, the S&P 500. I computed the returns using the LAN. And here are the weekly returns using average and standard deviation. I annualize them by multiplying them. In this case, it's weekly by 52 or by the square root of 52. Um, and those are typically numbers that I might use in an option Pricing model. So these, the 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 standard black controls doesn't use the average, but the standard sorry the annual standard deviations are something that you might use for um, uh, pricing options. You see here, for example, the Kroger is much riskier than the S and P over this particular period. That's it. Questions about this? All right. Now we're going to switch gears entirely. We're going to talk about binomial pricing. Now, strangely enough, binomial pricing and all of the simulation stuff is actually going to be connected. Okay, So I need both of these parts, as I was saying before, in order to actually do uh, Monte Carlo pricing. Um, OK, everybody here knows the binomial pricing model? Anybody not know this? If you don't know this, read this chapter. I, I'm going to go through this, the beginning of this, very, very fast. Um, so here's all the stuff I do in this, in this, in this particular uh, PowerPoint. I do a one-period binomial pricing model. I solve for options. You know what? 
you can read it. Binomial pricing model is the most common pricing model used besides Black and Scholes. And uh, it can actually be used to prove the Black and Scholes. And we're going to use it to prove the Black and Scholes uh, theorem, at least prove in numerical terms. Um, so I, I want to start with the stuff that I expect you to know. What's the things I expect you to know? The binomial pricing model says, suppose I have a stock. And suppose its price today is S0, and its price tomorrow is S0 times U and S0 times D. And in this spreadsheet, I give you an example of U and D. Okay, So U could be 1.10. And D could be, sorry, not 1.10%, 1.10. And D could be 0.97. That means that the stock price goes up by 10% and down by minus 3%. Now, I, I want to say something about symbols. I will try very hard. I, I think I've succeeded in using capital letters for 1 plus. So if I want to say R is 6%, then when I write R, that's capital R, that's going to be 1.06. The same thing here. These are capital U and capital D. It's just simpler to do all of this in terms of 1 plus the return and not the return itself. OK, so here's a very simple example. In this particular example, the stock price starts at 50. It goes up by 10% to 55, or down by 3% to 48 and a half. The bond price goes, if, if you invest a dollar in the bond today, the bond price goes from 1 to 1.06. And now you have a call option. And the call option has an exercise price of 50. So I don't know what the price of this call option is going to be. That's what I'm going to solve using the binomial um, framework, but the exercise price is 50, so if the stock price is 55, this is going to give me 5, and here it's going to give me 0. Okay? So tell me what's the basic insight of solving this binomial uh, problem? How do I solve for the call price? Tell me what to do. What? There's a formula. What is the formula? Maybe there's an intuition, too. You can combine the, you can build the call from the stock and the, and the, and the, uh, stock and the bond in some ratio that gives you the same. Absolutely. The, 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 the word that you want to remember is replication, which means copying. Okay, The idea behind the binomial framework is you can rep replicate the call with a combination of the stock and the bonds. So what you do is you do the following. You know, it's all written here. You say, suppose I take a portfolio with A stocks and B bonds, and now I'm going to find A and B so that the payoff is exactly the option payoff. So the option payoff is 5 in the upstate and 0 in the downstate. Okay? But I'm going to do this with stocks and bonds. So what am I going to do? I'm going to say the following. In the upstate, I bought A stocks 
and the price is 55 and I bought B bonds and they return 6% and the call in the upstate gives me 5 and in the downstate I bought A bond A stocks and it's 48 and a half that's the price and I bought B bonds and that's zero okay now that's two equations and two unknowns I trust you to know how to solve that all right and here's the solution the solution by the way this this solution is the solution for calls is always that A is positive and B is negative and one of the things we always say to people is a call is a long position in the stock and a short position in the bond. In this particular case, it turns out that you need 0.7692 stocks and you have to borrow $35.95.9. Okay? And what's the cost of that? Well, the cost is down here. There's the cost of buying 0.7692 stocks. And there's the borrowing. And the net, so the net investment is 3.2656. And 3.2656 is the value of the call. OK? Say yes. Don't say anything. I don't care. You can do the same thing to solve for, for puts. OK, here's the solution for puts. I leave it to you to read this in the book. And you can figure it out because you're smart people. OK, here's something that I don't think we study in uh, uh, our investments class, but which is very, very important in this class. All right, It's the exact same thing I did before. I mean, really nothing different but different names, and it calls the pricing of stocks and bonds by state prices. So let me tell you about state prices, and let me tell you how to derive state prices. And what I want you to notice is that in the first two minutes of this discussion, I'm not even going to talk about options. OK. So I want you to think about a security, which I'll call an up security. It's a security that pays off $1 when the stock price goes up and pays off 0 when the stock price goes down. And I want you to think about a down security, it pays off zero in the up state and it pays off one dollar in the down state. And these things have prices. I'm going to call the price of this one QU and I'm going to call the price of this one QD. And now I'm going to use what's a basic fact of asset pricing. It's called linearity. OK, what does linearity mean? Well, in our little case, linearity means the following. Let's take the stock. The stock pays off 55 in the upstate and 48 and a half in the downstate. OK, and these, these QUs and these QDs, these are the state prices. Think of them as very specialized present value factors. It's like a present value factor only for the upstate and a present value factor only for the downstate. And the equations I get here are for the stock 55QU plus 
48 and a half QD, and that's 50 because that's the stock price today. And for the bond, 1.06 QU plus 1.06 QD equals 1 because that's the bond price today. Okay, and again, I have two equations and two unknowns, and I can solve these two equations, and here is the solution. Who said there's a formula? Maybe that's what you meant. Okay, so let me just talk about this formula for a second. So, QU equals R minus D over R times U minus D, and QD equals U minus R over R times U minus D. And in this particular example that I've chosen to illustrate, QU equals 0.6531, meaning a dollar in the good state is priced today at 65 cents, and a dollar in the bad state is priced today at 29 cents. All right, let's think about things that appear and don't appear. So what appears? What appears is the returns, the riskless return, the up and the down. Where did the stock price go? Where's the 50? Where's the S0? What? No. It's on the red, right? No. You see it anywhere? It, it disappeared. What? No, I don't know what that means, it's linear. I, I think you're right. What that means is the following. I solved this equation, but if you look at this equation, what's 55? 55 is S0 times U. What's 48 and a half? It's S0 times D. What's 50? It's S0. So maybe that's what you meant. I call that homogeneous, but, but I won't argue with you about um, the language. So what's the point? The point is I can just eliminate it. Okay. So you don't see the stock price here. All you see are the returns. All right, that's one point. Okay, here's another point. QU plus QD is 1 over R. In this case, it's 1 over 1.06. And again, that's not rocket science. That's the way I wrote this. Just important to, to, to check out these things. Um, anything else interesting I can say about this? Sometimes people worry about whether QU and QD are probabilities. Are they probabilities? Are QU and QD probabilities. Who said no? Maybe somebody says yes. Yes or no? No, no why not? You're right also, but the, 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 the really cheap idiotic answer is the one given by our friends over here. Okay. Nothing personal, which is they don't sum to 1 because they sum to 1 over 1 plus the interest rate. Okay? So they don't sum to 1. They couldn't be probabilities. But, so, but, R times QU and R times QD do, do is uh, emphasized, right? do sum to 1. So, are they probabilities? I don't know. They're not really probabilities, but uh, a lot of 
pricing and finance revolves around this, and these things are called risk-neutral probabilities. We will use the risk-neutral probabilities later next week, I hope, when we start to do uh, Monte Carlo, okay, for options. Let's see. Anything else interesting we can say about this? Nah. Here, I solve this. Okay, let's talk about three dates. Let's talk about multiple dates, and then we'll see why this is useful. Okay, so... In a, in a, so you know how, how to derive QU and QD. So what I have on the board right now is I have a three-date model. Let me talk about dates and periods, okay? Sometimes I will want to call this date 0, date 1, date 2. That's three dates. But it's only two periods. Period 1, period 2. So this is a two-period, three-date model. And what happens in this two-period, three-date model is the following. The stock price starts at S0. It goes up by U, or it goes down by D. And then in the next period, the stock price, so let's take it from here. So here the stock price is, it was 55 using my numbers before. What happens here is the following. It's S0 times U, and here it goes down. So this is S0 times U times D. And here it goes up. It's S0 U squared. And here it goes up. So it was S0 D. And now it's S0D times U. And here it's S0D squared. OK? Notice that this is the same, right? This price occurs twice. OK? There are, if you like, two paths which lead to this occurrence. You can either go up and down or you can go down and up. This is the famous binomial problem. Okay? In every one of these periods, U and D is the same. So let's talk about principles here. U and D are the same in period 1 and period 2. And that means, and R is the same, because the bond price goes from 1 to 1.06 to 1.06 squared. And that means that QU and QD are, these are the one period state prices. They're also the same. You can confirm all of this. Let's think about, you know what, as long as I'm here, let's, let's stick with this for a second. OK, so here's the story. The story is the stock price went from 50 to 55 to 48 and a half to 60 and a half, 53, 
47 and a half, 47.04. And now let's price, it's, it's a further slide, but I'll just write it on the board. Let's price a call option So we're going to price a call x equals 50. So it's an at the money call where the maturity of the call is date 2. It's the end of the period. OK? So what does that call payoff look like? Okay, let's start up here. The stock price up here is 60.5. You see it? The call is a call with an exercise price of 50. The payoff is max 60.5 minus x, sorry, minus 50 or 0. So this is 10.5. What about here? The call price, the the stock price is 53.35. The call has an exercise price of 50, 3.35. What about down here? The stock price is 47 and something. The exercise price is 50, 0. OK? Now, there, if I were teaching a basic options course, I would draw something on the board that looks like this, and then I'm going to have to erase all of this, I would say to you, you know what? There are really three separate binomial problems here. There's this one, and that prices the call back to here. And there's this one, and that prices the call back to here. And then there's this one, and that prices the call back to here, and that's what I want to do. OK? But um, this is an advanced course, so we can skip those three prices, and we can do the following. We can just look at paths. In the first half of the course, I was constantly drawing the efficient frontier, and now I'm constantly making these, these binomial uh, trees. And I'm not very good at either one of them. Drawing. So this is, what did we say? 10.5, 3.35, 0. OK, now I'm going to price these paths. OK, let's see. How did I get to this number? What did I have to do? I, yeah, two ups. I went up and I went up. OK? And so I went 10.5. You went up and up. And the state price for an up is QU. So this is priced at QU, and this is priced at QU. And the present value. These are not present values in the classic sense, right? These are present values along a path. But the present value of 10.5 is 10.5 times QU squared. Just to make this symmetric, how did I get to 0? Well, I went down and I went down. So the present value is 0 times qd squared. I know that the present value of 0 is 0, so I, I, maybe I didn't have to include that, but I'm just doing this to make this completely general. OK, now, how did I get to this point? OK, well, to get to this point, you went either up and down, up and down, or you went down and up. So there are 
two paths that reach that point. Each path has a state price QU times QD, and the value is 3.35. So if you take 10.5 times QU squared, 2 times QU, QD times this, and 0 times this, then you'll get the option price. OK? What does that mean? That means that the option pricing, the binomial, this is the last thing I'm going to do, the binomial option pricing model is completely generalizable as long as up, down, and the interest rate remain the same. Let me give you one more example. OK. How many dates are there here? Five dates. How many periods are there? Four. In each of these five dates, the stock price goes up by 10% or down by 3%. In each of these five dates, the interest rate goes is 6%. So the state prices, the one period state prices are the same. OK? And in this example, like in the previous example, I have a call, which is an at-the-money call. So what's an at-the-money call mean? It means that when you get to date four, you compare the stock price, 73.2, to the exercise price of 50. There's the payoff. The stock price of 64.55, here's the payoff, and so on and so forth. Yes? These are European calls, only European calls. Next week I will discuss. I can also price American calls. I can even do it in Excel. It's not a big deal. OK? European calls. So now all I have to do is this counting exercise. All right? So let me show you how this counting exercise works, and then I'll give you the formula. And that will be the end of today. I'm not planning to go anywhere <coughs> out of the country next week, so the class will start on time. <coughs> so let's look at the top price and the bottom price. Okay, How do you get to 23.2? The only way you can get to 23.2 is, yes. is to go up five times. The only way you can get to, sorry, up four times. Thank you. Who said that? Whoever said that, thank you. The only way you can get to this bottom zero is to go down four times. The rest of this stuff gets a little trickier. And for this, you need to know some some combinatorics, usual sort of high school combinatorics. So for example, how many paths are there that lead to 64? Well, there's, there's always one up. Sorry, there's always one down, and there are always three ups. It can be up, up, down. It can be up, up, down, up, OK? And the number of paths, to remind you, is 4 over 1. And who said 3? I think that's right. OK? 4 over 1 is, by the way, Excel, let's talk about Excel. Who cares how many, what the number is? Excel has a function that does this. It's called binom41. And it gives you the binomial coefficient. So. We have 4 over 1 paths. On each path, we have QU cubed times QD. And each path has the same payoff. And the payoff is 14.55. The next one is the same thing. It's 
four dates. It's two ups and two downs. Q U squared Q D squared, and what's the number? Six point nine two four five. And there's another one which is four over three Q U times Q D cubed, and that number is zero point one nine seven. And this one, it's four over four. So you see the idea? Oh, okay. So there's a very, very, very simple extension to multiple periods as long as the up and the down are the same. And here is that. Why did I write all this stuff on the board when I've got it in this beautiful slide? So here it is. You want to price a binomial European call in a state pricing framework? No big deal. Take the sum, n over i, i is the number of ups, q u to the i, q n to the q d to the n minus i, max. You want to price a binomial, you want to price a put in a European binomial framework. Same formula over here, just reverse the max. By the way, Put call parity works, right? Put call parity has nothing to do with binomial. It only has to do with European options. The only tricky thing in put call parity here is that this framework is discrete. So if it's discrete, the present value is x over r to the power n. It's not the LAN, it's the discrete present value. And there's a, an Excel VBA implementation. Um, I'll leave that to you. OK, I think that's enough for today. Uh, as usual, I'll be sending out the homework. I have a very terrible day tomorrow, so it could be that the homework only goes out tomorrow night, not tomorrow morning. I hope that won't bother you. See you next week.